are, so we know we're looking for the abomination of desol desolation. Have we, in any of the passages that we covered in Daniel yet, do you feel like we've, we've, we've hit anything that we could say that's the abomination of desolation? No, not yet. Not really, right? I mean, we know we've gone through these three different kinds of prophecies, but really what we're just laying out is kind of the historical and political framework in which this is all taking place. Now, um, do, do you guys see my screen here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I just want to double check. Um, so so we, we kind of have our four kingdoms, which are going to dominate history, and then um, Daniel's going to interject some things within that now that we have that. So Daniel's prophecies coming in order, if you understand them, they're really laying down a framework, much like God prophecies. If you really follow prophecy from Genesis through Revelation, you realize God lays out a, a bigger scheme of things and then keeps interjecting things within different points on that scheme. Because ultimately, at the end of this, he, he, you, know, he, you go all the way back to Eve and he says, I'm going to produce a seed through you who's going to crush the serpent's head, right? And it's mm -hmm. like he's, he's given you the end from the beginning. But there's a lot of things that go forward into that from there. And then we learn that, you know, the different things he's saying to Adam and Eve, the way he judges them, the way he puts them through certain things, the way, the way he deals with Cain and Abel, the way he deals with Noah. These are all projecting type, typologically, at least prophetic things. And then he gives more express prophecies. And then he's going to carry out things within the context of those prophecies. So um, when you get on a vein of just, again, following the lead that the Lord put in front of you, you know, we have it in Daniel. Daniel's now going to send us back to Jeremiah. And uh, when we get to uh, Daniel, he's going to actually send us back to Jeremiah and Deuteronomy because that's what's going on in Jeremiah, Jeremiah as a fulfillment of something in Deuteronomy. So we're going to follow that trail back and get even more depth into this framework to understand what's going on here. And then we're going to carry that forward into Daniel's prophecy again. So with that understanding, and then go, okay, so now he's given us some more details, but we have this framework, so we have a deeper understanding of it. So we are on um, Daniel 9, right? Yes. Okay. Tyson, you want to kick off? Yes, sir. Let's go down to, um, we're going to start in 1, and let's go with... Um, let's just do... Uh, just 1 to 19 there. All right. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of uh, Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay, let's pause and I said, for a second, for just a second. So do you know who Darius, the son of Ahasuerus is? Yes, that's the, um, he, he overtook Babylon. Right, so um, remember the last two prophecies that we, we read were in the first and uh, third year of, um, was it Belshazzar? Yeah, the grandson. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Um, so Darius would have conquered him, so now we're in the first year of Darius, so we're pretty close after this. So I want to just lay that out for you because you remember Daniel's first prophecy that he interpreted that Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He was a pretty young man when he did that because um, that would have been pretty shortly after they were taken to Babylon. And that's how Daniel got famous. That's how him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego kind of got some you know, positions of status there. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, he's down to Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So he would have been quite older by that time, right? So, so he has those two prophecies within two, two years, and then this is going to be the following year after this, and he's only going to give one prophecy after this, but this Darius actually, I think he dies within like a year or so of that reign, because he was a pretty old man by the time he conquered Babylon, and then the, the Persian king is going to take over from here. So all these prophecies that Daniel has, with the exception of that one he interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, all roll out within about five years. So I want to just kind of give you that framework. And then if you understand now Daniel's an old man, how long, just if you want to take a guess, have they been in Babylon? What, 65 years? It's actually get, getting right up to 70. So we're, we're getting these prophecies and we're going to prove this out. But um, he's, he's, it's the first year of Darius, the son of Azurius. So he's taken Babylon, but they're, they haven't been given their decree to go back to Jerusalem yet. That actually happens under Cyrus, which is the next king. And you'll find that in uh, the book of Ezra. So they're still in Babylon, 
And that's why he's talking about 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So um, why don't we do this? I'm going to let you finish reading up to 19, and then we're going to jump back to Jeremiah, because I want, I want to just give you that context. So they're towards the end of 70 years, and that's why he's now bringing this up into his mind, okay? Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. And I set my fa face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confessions and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants and prop the servant thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our king, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confess confusion of faces as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is, upon, is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses. All this evil has come upon us, yet may we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil, and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that hath that hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten the re re renown, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, our, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and that cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thy ear and hear. Up, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses but for but for thy great mercies O lord hear O lord forgive O lord hearken and do defer not for thine own sake O my god for thy city and thy people are called by thy name so he's given this big supplication to the Lord to really get down to what, what, what is he asking the Lord? What is he asking him to do? To forgive them and turn away the captivity. Turn away their captivity, right? What word do they see, keep using in relation to their captivity? Desolation. Desolation, right? So that's, that's a word that we're going to, we're going to, we want to focus in on because that word desola desolation always has two connotations. One desolation can mean something is defiled. Another thing it can mean is it's ruined and, and laid waste. Okay. So when, when he's referring to desolations, he could be referring to a thing being defiled or laid waste. In this connotation, what, what do you think he's referring to? Being um, laid waste. Why is that? Because he keeps referring back to the law of Moses and um, the oath 
the, the curses that were poured out upon them. Right. In the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Yeah. So he's asking them, God to forgive them and basically um, roll back the, the curse, you know, which is essentially allowing them to return to Jerusalem, right? So now he, he references a couple of different prophecies here. So, so who's, wh where do we need to go to figure out what he's talking about? Remember, we're first century Christians. We don't have a deep understanding of the Old Testament because we're Gentiles. Where do we need to go to understand what he is talking about? Uh, Deuteronomy 28. For Moses, right? Yeah, well, well, we'll talk about the when he says the curse has been poured out on us. Right. Um, you guys probably know your Old Testament really well. So what, what curse is he talking about? I'm actually, De Deuteronomy is my personal reading right now. So I just, I literally just read this. Yeah, that's the so, Deuteronomy 28. Yeah, so verses 15, 1 through 15 is talk about the blessings and 15 through 68 is talks about the curses for not keeping the commandments of the Lord. Right. Yeah, it's all and, relating to the land and being being basically taken out of the land, the enemies coming and taking them out of the land. And yeah, it's, it's very detailed. Right. I mean, he gives them a lot of pretty specific stuff to, uh, in terms of what's happening right here, right? Yeah. So I think the main one he's referring to is Deuteronomy 28. Um, and he, he does this earlier too, because I'm just in like chapter 14 or 15 and he's he's getting into it there, but he's He's already telling them before they go into the land how they're going to be, get thrown out of the land, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's. It, I mean, he gives them the if then, right? Just like he gives Saul the um, King Saul the if you obey all my laws, my statutes, I will establish your kingdom, right? Right. Um, he gives them the if then, but he, he's already telling them that they're going to fail, and that is because the old covenant is based in the flesh, right? Um, we can't we can't succeed without God's spirit because our flesh is in bondage to the fear of death and we ultimately do what our flesh craves because of that. Um, so he says, you know, it'll come to pass if you not hearken to the, the voice of your Lord to observe all his commandments and statutes, what I command thee this day, that all the curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then he just gets into all these different curses and I'm not going to get to all of them, but it's like, you know, it's essentially the opposite, right? Of everything that he promises to bless them and if they, they keep the law, um, and then, let's see, he talks about when they, when they get a king and what the king shouldn't do, but the king's going to do that. Yep. Um, the Lord, thy God shall bring thee in thy king, which shall sh set over thee unto a nation, which neither thou though thy, nor thy fathers have known and there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. Um, let's see. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies that the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he will put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he has destroyed thee. Remember the yoke of iron in Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. Remember the story where the guy, he puts a wooden yoke on him and then this other false prophet comes in and breaks it and then he puts an iron yoke on it. Mm. Um, so ultimately, basically the promise to, to, to tell you, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do to you is fulfilled in the book of Jeremiah because that's what Jerusalem is ultimately destroyed. Right. So, um, and then I was back in, uh, I want to say it's like 12. And he talks about all the destruction of the nations that um, in order for them to get the land. Maybe it's not 12. Bear with me for a second. Apparently read a lot of this. Oh, right here. This is uh, Deuteronomy 8. He says, when you have eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments, his judges and statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built godly houses, goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and the silver and gold is multiplied that and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. 
Um, and he says, and thou say in my heart, my power and the might of mine hand has gotten this wealth. Because he says, uh, he says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he must, may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be if thou forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face. So shall you perish because you are, you are, you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord, your God. So, so he's telling them this. And then when we get, you know, going deeper and deeper in Deuteronomy, he's essentially laying out from exactly how it's going to happen. He, he tells them how their King's going to mess up and everything. And then we get down to uh, Jeremiah and after, after years of prophets coming to their Kings and now Northern Israel gets taken into captivity. Uh, Southern Ju Judah even gets worse, you know, even just a generation or so after seeing this, they get worse and worse and worse until the point that he, he, he destroys them out of the land. And that, that is, that is their time of desolation. So now uh, it boils down to uh, it, in Deuteronomy, he actually, actually talks about God scattering them throughout the nations and then regathering them into the land after that. And Jeremiah lays out basically the specifics of how God's going to go about doing that. So we're going into now Jeremiah 25. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start in verse 11 here, actually. We're going to start in verse 8. Can you, Tyson, can you read from 8 and four to 14? Yep. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take that, take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the milestones, the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to their works of their own hands. Okay. So, um, so, so notice he, in, in his original prophecy, he lays out 70 years, right? To be under Nebuchadnezzar, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But is Nebuchadnezzar ruling over them the, the whole 70 years? No. Because he, cause he dies and his grandson's in charge by the time they leave, right? Yeah. So, so we know that Nebuchadnezzar is the one who institutes this, but when he says the king of Babylon, is the king of Babylon ruling at the end of that 70 years? No. Right. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is the first person who God uses to destroy him, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then the king of Babylon doesn't necessarily have to be Nebuchadnezzar, right? Right. So we, we know that um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon, is going to come against them. But then we know that they're going to serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Can you guys think of any other prophecies about the king of Babylon? Not off the top. Okay. So uh, there's actually two prophecies where Satan is mentioned. Uh, one is a prophecy against the city of Tyre. And the other is a prophecy against uh, the king of Babylon. And this is actually in Jeremiah as well. I believe. Are you referring to Ezekiel? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. He, he does refer to the king of Babylon, and I'm thinking of another one there, but you're right. The, the one I'm thinking of is, is Ezekiel. Um, is Ezekiel 28, correct? Yeah, I believe so. One's in Isaiah and one's in Ezekiel. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm not too familiar with the book of Isaiah. I've been meaning to get into that one. It's, it's tough. <laughs> It, there's there's a lot in there. Um, you have to know your whole Bible pretty well for it to all flow. 
because he's all over the place. He's going to be in the first coming and the second coming. He's going to be in the old Testament, like um, captivities. Then he's going to be in the end times. Then he's going to be in the millennium. Like he prophecies about a lot of different stuff. Um, bear with me. Oh, it is, it is Isaiah. So this is what he says in Isaiah 14. So it's Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 is about the king of Tyre. Isaiah 14 is about the king of Babylon. And this is going to be important when we go forward, when we refer to the two Babylons in the end, last days, because Tyre is like a trade city and Babylon is like a religious military city, okay? So he says uh, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, oh, how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now, do you know when Isaiah prophesied compared to Jer Jeremiah? Good question. So this was actually um, a, a whole, like, like almost 100 years before. Hmm. So Nebuchadnezzar is not even a king yet. Um, there is a king in Babylon, and that king goes to send messengers to Hezekiah in his day. Remember when Hezekiah gets sick and God extends his life? Yeah. Um, so, so the king of Babylon sends messengers to him, and that's when Isaiah prophecies that they're going to go into captivity to Babylon. But um, there's no Nebuchadnezzar yet. So he, this is what he, he's talking about, the king of Babylon. And then he says, um, he that rules the nations in anger and is persecuted and none hinders. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir, fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come upon us. Hell has beneath, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at the day of thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say to thee, Art thou also become, as, become weak as we, as art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and thy no, noise to thy, thy bowels, vials. Uh, a worm is spread under thee, and worms cover thee. How how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakest the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought uh, down to hell to the sides of the pit. So that's Sheol, actually, not like the lake of fire. Um. They that see they shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, and and uh, is this the man who made the earth to tremble and did shake nations? So so we see this, um, and it, this is this is a passage you'll want to know because this is about that. But then it says, um, for I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will oops, and I will cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord, and I will make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the bosom of destruction, says the Lord. Um, so he's talking about this, hey, Aaron. and you notice it's before Nebuchadnezzar was, they, the, the Jews would have already had this metaphor in their head of the king of Babylon being a type of Satan himself, right? Hey, Aaron, I don't know if you know it, but your, um, your Bible app is not up. I know you usually have your Bible app showing. Oh, it should be showing. You're not seeing it? No, it's no it has the, the yeah. Okay, no, I'm sorry. This, I, it's, it's on my, that's why I asked if you guys saw my screen. What did you see on my screen? The slide. slide. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, but this wasn't showing, huh? No, yeah, it's still not showing. All right, well, let me figure out what I'm doing here. <laughs> because, there, can you see it now? Mm, no. Yeah, you, there still, it. you still just see the slideshow? It's no, no, you're good now. Okay, so apparently when I do screen share, I can pick one of my windows, like one of my applications, and rather than just my desktop, and that's that's why I was a little confused because it seemed different to me. Um, gotcha. so now you guys have both, right? You have this on the side, yeah, and then the Bible. App. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, call that out in the future because apparently I got to choose the one that has the desktop instead of the um, just the application. Otherwise, it's just going to show me that one window. Um, so, anyways, a hundred years before Jeremiah prophecies, uh, the the faithful Jews would have already had this metaphor in them that the King of Babylon is a representation of Satan himself. Okay. Mm. so so when jeremiah prophecies that a hundred years later and he's telling them that he's going to give them over to the king of babylon um it might not be an obvious thing to them 
but they really have this idea of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is the one who takes them, right? Um, but then at the end of the 70 years are accomplished, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, in the land of Chaldeans, I, I will make it perpetual desolations. Now, did God make the, the land of the Chaldeans at that time perpetual desolations? Not at that time. What, what does perpetual desolations mean to you? Basically, um, perpetually ruined. Um, no, no kings, no authority in the earth. Right. What did, what did we just say? What, what are the two meanings of desolation? Captivity. No, not that captivity. Exactly two definitions. Ruin and defilement. Yeah. Right. So one could be like spiritually defiled, right? Yeah. And then the other one can just be destroyed and laid waste, right? Yeah. So, so if we have these two desolations and he's, he's making Babylon a perpetual desolation, what, what does that sound like he's saying? In this instance, I guess it would be spiritually, spiritually defiled. Why is that? Uh. <laughs> Say, why are you choosing spiritually defiled over laid waste? Because when um, the Medes came in, they didn't really destroy Babylon. They just kind of just took it over. So they didn't really get physically destroyed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So That's, yeah, I, I want to understand your line of reasoning before I interjected anything. So, um, cause there's another thing that I, um, that he, uh, says right here that he's going to uh, make it a perpetual desolations. And this is because this is what he says next. And I will bring upon that land, all my words, which I have pronounced against it. Even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against the nations. Okay. So he actually is telling you it's in this book, what he's going to do to him. Okay. So, so that's why I wanted to ask what, what your, what your thoughts were before that. Cause see, I've already got this in my head. So I'm thinking, you know, I know what this is, right. Um, mm -hmm. But that's why you want to look for those clarifiers. So, so if you if you understand Jeremiah, uh, it's not just a nice succinct chronological book. Like the last chapter in the book um, reflects what is in. Um, it actually matches exactly the last chapter of the book of Second Kings. Um, it's like they merge together, and it's interesting because the last chapter of Second Chronicles matches the first chapter of Ezra, and one's about them coming out of that captivity, and one's about them going into it. So it's like. It's like that 70 year period ends with Jeremiah and begins with Ezra bringing them out. But it's like halfway through the book that, that they actually get sacked. Well, Jeremiah is kind of a, it's actually a collection of writings. Lamentations is one of those writings too, but um, you're going to have like a collection of writings. You're going to have uh, a writing about Jeremiah's commissioning to be prophesied. You're going to have a number of writings that are historical about what Jeremiah said and here's what happened. Right. And then you're going to have Babylon get sacked and then he's going to launch into these other prophecies uh, in the latter part of the book. And he's going to talk about um, basically the burden of Babylon, the burden of, uh, so I'm on Jeremiah 50 now. This starts in like 40, in the 40s, but you've got, you know, this he's saying about Moab. And he's going to give him all these prophecies. And these prophecies are all going to either come to fulfillment in that time or in the last days or both. Kind of an already not yet thing, okay? Um, so when he gets to chapter 51... He's going to talk about the final desolation of Babylon. So when he says he's going to do it according to all this in their books, um, he's giving you some specifics. And I'm going to just show you some of the things that he's saying. He's saying Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that has made all the earth drunken and the nations have drunken of her wine. And therefore, the nations are mad. What does that sound like? We haven't read this book yet. Revelation? What? Yeah, that's the mystery Babylon. So you see all this stuff and he talks about the Chaldeans, um, but there's stuff that he's going to say about, he, uh, about her. And they're talking about how the slain shall fall in their streets and um, all these people are going to die in here. But then he talks about, um, let's see. He talks about how he's going to raise up against her the spirit of the Medes, the kings of the Medes, which Darius the Mede comes against him the first time. But in the latter Babylon, I'm going to show you why this is the latter Bab Babylon. He says to destroy it because it is vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple, right? Well, in the, in the first desolation, they destroy the temple. What do they do in the second desolation? They, uh, they profane God. Right, through the abomination of desolation, so they defile it, right? 
So God has two different reasons to take vengeance on them for his temple in those two um, Babylons, right? Um, but then he talks about them. Um, he says, thou dwellest upon many waters. Does, does Babylon dwell, the old Babylon dwell on many waters? Uh -uh. No. I mean, you could kind of say that because it dwells between two major rivers, right? So maybe you could say that. But then he says, um, he says, behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. Is Babylon on a mountain? I don't think so, but I, I don't know. No, it's in, in Iraq. It's in a desert between two rivers. Like it's just flat. It's a desert, right? And he said, um, he said, oh, destroying mountain, which destroyeth all the earth, I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and I will make thee a burnt mountain. Hmm. Um, can you guys think of another burnt mountain in the Bible? Um, Sinai? Yeah. It was a burnt mountain, right? Yeah. Um, you know where they're building Neom? <laughs> Saw Mount Sinai, wow. right? Really? Yep. <laughs> and then he says, and they will not take of thee a stone for a corner or a stone for a foundation, but thou shalt be desolate forever, right? So, and, he, and then he talks about the nations that actually come up to make war against them. And then um, he talks about it being like a threshing floor, which Jesus is actually a prophecy about destroying, you know, after he takes the wheat, right? He burns the chaff in the threshing floor at the time of the harvest. Um, but then he does mention Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me and has crushed me and made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a dragon. He has filled his belly with my del delicacies. He has cast me out. The violence done to me and, and, and to my flesh uh, be upon Babylon, shall the inhabitant of Zion, Zion say, and my blood upon the inhabitant of Chaldea shall Jerusalem say. Um, and then he says, I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Is, is Babylon on a sea? Uh -uh. Is Neom on a sea? You know what you know what I'm talking about with Neom, right? Have I got onto that a little bit? I've, I've seen a little bit. I've, uh, you were, uh, I've seen a video. Not, I didn't get to watch all of that video you did, but it's like a technological city, right? Right. So, so this is what they're building. This is why I refer to it. One of my friends showed this to me a couple years ago. Oops. Um, this is this is where they're building it. And this is a project that the Jews and the Arabs are jointly working on. So the actual uh, Neom is right here, or the actual Mount Sinai is right here, and Neom is going to be built all around this. There are seven mountains in here, I checked. And then they're actually going to make a, a thing that crosses the Red Sea. So you see how it comes out like this? They're going to have all these islands, but they're going to actually have a bridge that crosses the Red Sea. So you would be able to physically walk the route that Israel walked from Egypt to Neom. And I believe they're building this up for like world pilgrimages to Mecca and, and, and Jerusalem in the last days. Um, and that's Mystery Babylon. I believe it's Jerusalem is the religious part. And then this is the sea trading part of it. Um, but I want to show you that because, again, it's on that burnt mountain Sinai and it's on sea. Right. And it's in the wilderness. Um, when he gets to, to Revelation, he's going to say he took me into the wilderness. Of course, this is the wilderness where the Jews wandered. This this is where they wandered the whole time and then up into here before they got in Israel. So um, it's a, you know, it's a prominent location that they're choosing to build this city. Um, anyways, he said he, he'll dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Now I want to show you where ancient Babylon is. Ancient Babylon would be right here and see where the Tigris and Euphrates River come down and they almost, they get pretty close. That's the closest point they are right there. And then they go their separate ways and then they flow into each other into the Persian Gulf. So Babylon is right here, but this is all desert around there and they've got good farming and stuff here because these two rivers, because of irrigation, but otherwise it's just a flat desert. So they're not near the sea. They're hundreds of miles from that. They're not near any mountains. This is, there are no mountains all around here. You don't get into mountains until you get into Iran over here and Turkey over here and then, uh, you know, Jordan and Israel over here. So, so he's describing this, this, this Babylon being near a sea, falling into the sea, falling down from the rocks, a burnt mountain, none of this stuff, and, and in a wilderness. The, the wilderness is the only part that could line up with the old Babylon. So the reason I'm showing you this is because when you get into prophecies and then there's stuff that just doesn't quite fit, doesn't make sense, 
that's when you want to start to wonder, is there a dual fulfillment here? Like are parts of it fulfilled in one place and then other parts later on? Um, because you, it, it might not possibly make sense in the historical fulfillment. And this is the same thing with preterism when we're looking at, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem versus the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem in the last days. Um, but some of the stuff that he talks about uh, with that, if you remember, if we're going to go back now to Jer uh, Jeremiah 25, where we were, when he says, I will take from, from them the voice of Merv, the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom and the bride and the sound of millstones and the light of the candle. That's actually right in Revelation 18, talk about mystery Babylon at the end. So we know from scripture, because he's talking these exact words, that this is it probably it has a partial fulfillment when the Jews are set free from uh, the ancient city of Babylon, but it's ultimately fulfilled in the destruction of mystery of Babylon in the last days. So if that's true, and we all also know that there's another kind of king of Babylon, which is Satan himself, um, then, then we can start to just suspect that there's another kind of 70 years, even before the angel goes and teaches that to Daniel. See, I want to show you these pieces because I want you to be able to go look at a prophecy and just look at it before anyone explains something to you and says, is there two fulfillments here? Or does this have multiple meanings here? Because they, in a lot of cases they do. Not in all of them, but in a lot of cases they do. Um, what we have from the apostles and from these angels who are explaining stuff to Daniel, we have the framework so we can understand the hermeneutics of how they're two different things, but um, it doesn't necessarily give you the answer for every single prophecy about how they're two different things. And you need to kind of understand that framework so you can take these other prophecies into the book of Revelation and see where they fit in, all right? That makes sense? Yep. Okay. So that's not an easy one to discern. If you don't know these books really well, it's not easy to poke around. But again, I've read Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and these, you know, dozens of times. So, you know, I'm still, I'm still learning stuff in, in these things every time I read them that I didn't see before. So, so uh, essentially this is the prophecy that Daniel's talking about. And um, after 70 years, they're, they're, they're no longer supposed to be serving the King of Babylon, but notice he says this here for many, this is the end of it for many nations and great, kings shall serve themselves of them also. So notice he's not just talking about specifically Nebuchadnezzar or even specifically the nation of Babylon. He says, many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their hands. So he's making it clear that this captivity of Israel, this 70 years and this king of Babylon actually represents many nations and kings. So when you get to like the letter in first Peter, Peter's actually referring to the to being in Rome, and he says, we who are in Babylon greet you. Because see, Peter now understands that all these Gentile nations are all Babylon in the spiritual sense. And they're under the king of Babylon until the second coming of Christ. That's really what, what that means. Because the real king of Babylon is Satan. And Satan rules this world until the second coming of Christ. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, so I wanted to show you how like it's in the text already that it's not just about them, but it's subtle, right? Like if you, if you read these prophecies really carefully and you just reason out the things that don't make sense based on history, you have enough to go on to go. There's something more here than just a plain 70 years captive to the city of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. So now when we get back to Daniel, we know this is the fulfillment of Moses. We know Moses in, in the promise of Moses, God will bring him back to land. We know in the promise of Jeremiah, God will bring him back to land after 70 years. So we've got this. And so now we're at the end of this 70 years and Daniel is going, it's time to fulfill. And, and he understands that. And that's why he says to the Lord, defer not. What is he saying? What, what is he asking the Lord when he says, O Lord, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do defer not for thine own sake. Keep, keep your promise that you made previously. Right. What does defer mean? To deviate. Right. Or, or even, well, if, if, I, if, if I were def to defer my teaching to Michael, what am I doing? Withhold. Right. I, I'm not teaching. I'm deferring for Michael to teach, right? Oh, oh. Um, so, so, so deferring typically means, it can mean delay. It can mean to, to, to pass the buck kind of thing, you know? Um, I'm going to just look at this in the original Hebrew. Let's see what it says here. Defer, the word is akar. 
and it means to loiter, like hang around, right? To procrastinate, to continue, defer, delay, hinder, be late, stay, tarry long. Does that make sense? Gotcha. So he's saying don't delay to fulfill what you said after 70 years, right? Now, based on stuff that they have, they have enough in the prophets already to know that that 70 years is not necessarily 70 years. Now, when God doesn't fulfill something exactly what, how we expect it, right? Is it, for, is it for his benefit or ours? Usually for ours. Right. It's, it's mercy, right? Mm -hmm. So they have this kind of thing going on with them already. Like you go all the way back to Adam, right? When Adam died on the day he ate of the fruit, did he die physically that day or did he die in the thousand year day? In the thousand year day. Right. And so when Nineveh was dest and destroyed after it says um, 40 days, it says they would be overturned, right? When they were overturned 40 days, but were they destroyed? No. No, it was like, it was a kind of overturning, a spiritual overturning, right? So when God uses these multiple meanings and things, he, what he is doing is he's withholding an opportunity for himself to show mercy, but he's given you, he's given you his words in such a way that you'll take them seriously, right? So if, if, if I said, if I said, um, I don't know, like if I said, if uh, I don't know, I didn't have a good example besides the ones he gives you, honestly, like he, he's telling Adam, you will die of the day you eat the fruit, right? He wants him to take it very seriously, right? But it, he knows Adam's going to fail to keep that promise or keep, keep that word. And so he creates a way for Adam to die and yet live, right? And, and live and yet die. That's the whole born again consequence is, was already pre-built into Adam, right? Because God established two different kinds of days. He established a day, you know, before he created the sun, moon, and stars, and then a day after he created the sun, moon, and stars. So he can make a day two different lengths, right? To himself. Just like God is many in one, he can have a day be a thousand years and also a day, right? Well, he's doing the same thing with his 70 years. If God had totally fulfilled this, um, promise at the end of these 70 years what would god have had to do based on what we read in jeremiah destroy everybody <laughs> right utterly perpetual desolation right yeah. utterly destroy them all the nations forever right yep. is god out to just destroy the gentiles because he doesn't like the gentiles no. <laughs> no we already have that proven in, in jonah right yeah you know, Jonah was the first of all the books of the prophets. Jonah was the first one historically. He was older than all the rest. Um, so God establishes that very on early on. And he also establishes in, um, in uh, really in the first promises to Abraham that the Gentiles are supposed to trust in Abraham, right? And all the nations would be blessed through him, right? So God wants to bless the Gentiles and Israel is, is the instrument of his blessing. But he also makes this promise to Israel to punish the nations around them and to deliver them from this bondage, right? So he is going to fulfill that in one sense, but there's a bigger sense that he's going to now allude to um, because God has bigger plans for the Gentiles. So he does, you know, again, uh, Darius is going to die that year and then Cyrus is going to take over and then Cyrus is going to give him permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. So he does fulfill it literally in those 70 years, but then there's a wider fulfillment and which is why they're still technically captive to the kings of Babylon, but they are allowed to live in Jerusalem. So, um, so he's saying, defer not, don't delay to do this, uh, for thy own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people that are called by thy name. And what he's essentially saying is he has an expectation that God is literally going to fulfill his promise in 70 years, and he will, but this angel is going to show up and make sure he understands the fuller meaning of that prophecy, because it's going to tie into all of his prophecies, okay? So now we're going to go to 20 through 27. Uh, why don't you go ahead and hit that, Tyson? <laughs> Hold on one moment. <laughs> Daniel chapter nine. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin 
and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to shoot thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that for that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in the troublous times. And after, the, after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until consummation that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay. Now do we have an abomination of desolation? Yeah. What, it, what does that sound like he's saying? Is that a confusing question or you guys can't hear me? No, we can't hear you. I'm just thinking before I speak. Okay, okay. I don't see an abomination of desolation. You don't see it's, it very clearly? I mean, it says the overspreading of abominations, yes, and he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay. So maybe we don't have a clear implication of what the abomination of desolation is, but we see abomination and desolate, right? Correct. So, so there's some kind of overspreading of abominations and it makes it desolate. So there's something going on until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So we are talking about a, some kind of abomination that makes desolate, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really know what that is, right? Right. We just know that there is some kind of abomination that makes desolate. Right. So, um, so I'm going to take you guys to, to this real quick. So these are, the, these are the nations that we talked about in the original statue, the gold, silver, bronze, and then the iron, iron mixed with clay. And those match up to Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And then, of course, Rome has two parts. The second part is, you know, the, the new one world, Rome, right? And then the four beasts we had, we had the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then the terrible beast, right? And then we had the the... the prophecy about the ram and the he goat which represents alexander and or i'm sorry that's the persians and alexander the great and then how alexander the great breaks into four four generals and then the antichrist comes from one of their kingdoms remember all that mm -hmm. so the, the 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 literal 70 years they have is right here and from the time that babylon begins and ends that literal 70 years is over um again the next king is going to be cyrus and cyrus is going to give the decree to go back to Jerusalem and build the temple. So this is going to happen like in the next year or so. It's it's going to be pretty quick here. And Ezra is going to be the one that leads them to do that. So the stuff that he's talking about there, he says, first of all, you have 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and on that thy holy city to finish the transgression. Okay. So the this 70 that, that literal 70 years is done, but now this other 70 weeks are determined. And and, and the word weeks here, I think it just means seven. Um Shabuah. And uh, Shabuah just basically means seven or sevens. It's, um, it's kind of like uh, 
in the New Testament, I think they just call it, call it um, Sabbaths, or um, it's a word like Sabbaths, but that Sab is, is, is their seven. Um, so when they say Sabua, it means a seven, it literally means seven, um, but um, basically it just, it just means seven of something. So it can mean a week or it can mean seven sevens or 77s. Um, so these 70 weeks, this is normally what it is determined of. It means 70 periods of seven years. Um, so that's um, 490 altogether. And it says, are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression. So this is important with this list of things that's here. One is to finish the transgression. What do you think that means? Um, basically, killing the Messiah. That would be part of the transgression, yeah. So let's see if there's other uses of the word transgression that are prominent. It looks like there's a lot of them. So uh, Romans refers to Adam's transgression, which is the original sin. So basically transgression is any breaking of the law. Um, so if they're saying the transgression, it's probably not just any breaking of the law. This is probably finishing Adam's transgression. So that's the finishing of Adam's original sin. Then it says to make an end of sins. So that's the transgression, and then this is the end of sins, okay? So Adam's transgression is the curse that's on the whole earth, which is basically we're all in bondage to Satan. An end of sins is our repentance and basically Christ paying for our sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity is what Christ does to pay for our sins to God, right? And to bring in everlasting righteousness, well, that's what Christ gives to us, right? So could you make a case that all this stuff is pretty much done in his first coming? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Now we have, and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Can we make a case that those are done in, in Christ's first coming? First coming? Yeah. No. Why is that? Because it says it's to seal up the vision and prophecy. What do you think that means, seal up? Good question. Isn't that what um, Daniel had to do once he received the, his last prophecy? He had to seal it up. And... Yeah, he actually did. Um, so the word it says to close up, especially to seal, make an end, mark, seal up, stop. Okay. So prophecies are 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 finished. That's literally what that means. It means no more prophesying. Right. Okay. So was there an end to prophesying in Christ's first coming? No. Nope. We know that pretty specifically, right? Yeah. I mean, we have prophets right in the New Testament. Christ no. prophesied himself. <laughs> we got the book of Revelation, right? right. So that definitely didn't seal up prophecy. And there's some people, that's why some people are going to try to stretch this to 70 AD. Um, still doesn't work any way you spin it. You've got, you've got pro the book of Revelation was written after 70 AD. You still have prophets in the church. And then you still have unfulfilled prophecies because there's prophecies about Christ's second coming, right? So even if you thought all these prophecies only had a historical fulfillment, Christ isn't back yet. So there's still unfulfilled prophecy, right? Right. And then of course, we know the two witnesses are two prophets that show up in the last days, right? So right. Um, do you guys have any ideas on where, what that might be referring to, to seal up vision and prophecy? Um, when Christ returns, is when he sets up his kingdom. Right. Um, but there's a specific, uh, that's a specific reference to somebody um, because he says, I don't see if they put it in there and it doesn't look like they did. In the book of Zechariah, That. In the book of Zechariah, there's a prophecy that talks about it actually fulfills in the millennium. I think it's um, I'm 
Might be Zechariah 12. No, that's not it. I'll have to find that one next time. Technically, that's chronologically after Daniel, so that'd be kind of cheating for us to go there. Um, we'll, we'll find that prophecy later, but there's a prophecy where he talks about there's going to be a time where if anybody puts on like a, a hairy garment, like a prophet's mantle, um, that there will be no more prophecy, and that person is to stab. If, if their child does that, they're to stab them through with a sword, basically, um, because it's there's it's, all prophecy is outlawed, essentially. So when the Lord's here on earth, he's going to be reigning from Jerusalem and all the, all the resurrected saints who know everything that he knows are going to be here on the earth. So if anyone else rises up and says, thus saith the Lord, it's just an automatic, they're a false prophet. Right. And so they kill him. Okay. So that's what that's referring to, but I'm not, we'll, we'll get to that later, but because the reason is, is, you know, we'll get to that probably when we're talking about the millennium, but the reason is because that's chronologically after Daniel. So these guys who would have received this prophecy would not have, would not have known that because Zechariah hadn't come yet. Um, so, so seal, to seal up vision and prophecy, that, that literally means to stop. That means there's no more visions, no more prophecy. Um, can you think of anything in the new Testament that might refer to that as well? Kind of similar, I guess, when, when Jesus said the law and the prophets were unto John, but since then the kingdom of God has been preached. Okay. Oh, but that's referring to the old Testament though. Right. So if you, it, you know, in first Corinthians, where it talked about the spiritual gifts chapters, like 11 through 14. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when Paul says, um, I know in part and I prophecy in part when, but when um, perfection comes, um, what is, what is in part will be done away with. Right. So he essentially tells them that there's not going to be any more speaking in tongues or prophesying or anything like that. Once Christ returns. Um, I think that's in, I want to say it's tw uh, Corinthians 12 or 13. So Paul is actually telling them, there's going to be a time when there's going to be no more prophesying or anything. So he's, he's also referring back to Daniel and to uh, Zechariah as well. Um, and then this other part, it says to anoint the most holy. What do you think that means? Set up um, Christ setting up his, his kingdom. As, okay. As king. well, why do you think that? Um, When you when you think of anoint, what does that mean? What gets anointed? A king, priest. Okay, kings and priests. What else gets gets anointed? The, the temple. Right, the temple itself, the implements. Right. So, did Jesus get anointed? He, he, uh, he is the anointed. He is the anointed, but uh, w what does anointed mean? Like sanctified. Right. How would they do that? Like baptism? Uh, no, actually, in the Old Testament, they would do it by pouring oil on them. Oil, yeah. Yeah. So that's how yeah. they would anoint a king or a priest or a prophet, right? right. Um, Jesus, in his first ever teaching in Luke 4, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me uh, to preach captivity, you know, freedom to the captives and give sight to the blind and all that. Um, so can you see how somebody could read all this and say that's all fulfilled? Because remember what you just mentioned about the law and the prophets being until John, right? Yeah. And the anointing the most holy could be Christ being anointed by the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So can you see how somebody could, could determine that all this is fulfilled in Christ's first coming? Mm-hmm. Just like somebody could determine that that um, Jeremiah's uh, seventy weeks or seventy years is fulfilled, you know, when when they get set free from Babylon, right? Yeah. Um. But we know. What? Why do we know? I mean, what specifically about this do we know is not fulfilled yet? Well, we know the vision and prophecy hasn't been sealed or stopped. Right, because for that to be true, we would have to have no more prophecies after Christ, Christ's first coming, right? 
Right. Mm -hmm. No prophecies to be fulfilled, no prophecies given, none. And that just doesn't work with the apostles' teaching. So we know it's not fully fulfilled, but there are some people who will say that it is, and those are people who are going to be against, they're going to be cessationists who are against spiritual gifts. Um, because they believe that, well, what that meant is that that was all to last until the, the Bible was completed. And now we have no more no more prophecy and stuff like that. And so um, that's how they try to reconcile this because it doesn't really make sense. But the problem is um, what you would have to do is have to have a literal seven years right after Christ's death to fulfill this prophecy in 70 weeks, right? Oh. Um, because we have 70 weeks to do all this. And then he's going to go on to say, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, and that is in um, Ezra when that takes place, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So the, the reason this is broken up is because the seven weeks represents 49 years. The three score and two weeks is going to represent, it's like 300 and I don't know, do the math on that times seven, um, but it's like 368 years or something like that. Um, and that puts you at 69 weeks, okay? And it says, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. So this is actually what occurs in um, the book of uh, Nehemiah. So Ezra starts the rebuilding of the temple in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah finishes it. And that period that it took them to do it was 49 years. So that's why he says there'll be seven weeks and then three score weeks. So so he's telling them how many weeks it's going to be from the, the, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the wall is done, the city, the street and the wall, and the temple's done as well. And then he's telling them how many weeks remain, three score and two weeks, until Messiah the Prince comes. So um, these 382 years after they're done is when Messiah the Prince comes, and that's actually Jesus' triumphal entry. That's how long that is until that time. Um, Chuck Missler has worked that out and all the exact numbers and stuff. I have not just because there's a lot of different little discrepancies about, well, there's multiple decrees given and which one do you start with? And, you know, that's, that's the dating stuff, but essentially he's giving them the time frame until how long it's going to be for them to rebuild everything. And then from that point, how long it's going to be until the Messiah comes. So when the Messiah comes, when Jesus comes in Jerusalem, he actually says, um, if, you know, they're telling him to keep his disciples quiet because they're saying Hosanna, Hosanna and waving palm fronds and treating them like a king. And Jesus says, if they would keep silent, the rocks themselves would cry out because the the rocks that they built that, that city in the street with um, dictated how long it would be until he got there. So that's why he said the rocks themselves would cry out. So, so you've got how long it's going to be till Messiah comes but you've got one week left over because you only have 69 weeks there altogether. Yep. And so then he says after three score and two weeks. So in other words, that's that part after the done building Messiah uh, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So that's Jesus dying for our sins. And then he says, and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So what do you think that represents? Um, Rome. 70 AD? Yeah. Okay, but then it says, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Is there a flood in 70 AD? No. Can you think of where there might be a flood? The flood of um, like an insurgency, like Romans taking over, like and making them flee out of the city. So we're talking. That could be. How how about an actual flood though? Hmm. Never thought of it that way. Well, look at it like this. So I'm 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 cheating again. I'm going to Revelation 12. This is what's talked about the Jews fleeing Jerusalem, like you said. Right. And you have um, you have them getting ready to flee Jerusalem, but this is all in symbols. And then Satan is cast out, says the devil and Satan that deceives the whole world. He's cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And then um, he says the dragon um, saw that he was cast into the earth. He persecuted the woman that brought forth the man child. And the woman was given two wings of an eagle that she might fly to the serpent, fly into the wilderness, into her place 
where she is nourished for a time, time, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Mm. So that could be a literal flood. Because it says the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I don't know what that looks like, though. I don't know what, you know, what causes this flood. I thought maybe he's going to flood like the Jordan River and make it too deep for them to cross, but I really don't know what the cause is. I, I really don't know. But, but this is going to be in the second desolation of, of Jerusalem that that happens. So that's another one of those things that it doesn't quite fit because in 70 AD, you don't have a flood, right? Right. There's nothing that anyone even tries to like allegorize as a flood, right? Like yeah. what, is, what is this flood about? <laughs> so, so getting back to Daniel 9, it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So remember how we talked about there's two kinds of desolation? Yeah. One is laying something waste and the other is defiling it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, was the temple defiled in 70 AD no. or was it laid waste? Laid waste. Laid waste, okay. In the second one, is it going to be defiled or laid waste? It's going to be defiled. Defiled, right? Um, so the end thereof shall be in the flood unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So we know that Messiah is cut off. Who, who's ruling when Messiah cu is cut off? Rome. Rome, right? And the people of the prince that shall come to, who des to destroy the city and the sanctuary, they're from where? Rome. Rome, right? So we've already established in these other prophecies, Rome has two phases, right? Mm -hmm. So we can split this off and say, well, that's phase one. This has got to be phase two of Rome, right? So we've right. already established by the statue and by the beast that there's two phases of Rome. Yeah. So we have here a split between Christ's first coming and then this is what's going to be surrounding his second coming. But that's not a simple, easy thing to, to know. You have to know these other prophecies to know that there's two Romes in order to be able to split this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have kind of just, just like we have two, Adam dies in two different ways, just like the 70 years in Jeremiah has two different parts to it. We have two different comings of Christ prophesied here. But we just don't realize it, right? Christ is going to make that clear to his apostles when we get to Luke 17 and all that. And then when he leaves and says he's going to leave and come back in the way that he left, now we know there's two comings. And that's where we know where that split's going to be because there's his first coming. And then right after that, he rises. And then the people, the princes that shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happens like 40 years later. And then this end with the flood and the desolations determined, that actually happens right after the rapture. Oh. So you have Christ's first and second coming between there, but it's kind of still veiled in a mystery. But we can tell by some discrepancies that there's more to this story than just a straightforward, this is going to happen than this and this, right? Mm -hmm. And when it, says the, when it says the people, people of the prince that shall come, uh -huh. is that speaking of what, Satan? Close. Who do you think the prince that shall come is? Antichrist. Right. Okay. So we've already had him alluded to in the horn, the little horn, right? Twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have this prince that shall come. And there are some people who, who, who say the prince that shall come is Jesus. And they say destroying the city and the sanctuary, that's Jesus. Nah. Frederick will try to do that to make it work. But the prince that <laughs> shall come is the Antichrist. We've already had him established twice. And it says, and he shall confirm, so, so the prince that shall come, right? Again, we only have two people mentioned here. We have the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come, right? So right. He, he just said Messiah, so this is obviously someone different, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so the prince that shall come is the last person you're talking about. So when he says, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, that's the prince, okay? Yeah. Um, so the prince confirms a covenant with many for one week. What do you think confirm a covenant means? Make a promise of peace. What does confirm usually mean? Establish. Establish. Too. Okay. Um, it says exceed, confirm, be great, be mighty, prevail. Put to more, strengthen, be stronger, be valiant. Mm. Gabar is the word, to be strong, to prevail. Um, so this word seems to be, in some, some translations, we'll, we'll put it as 
uh, uh, strengthen or confirm. Confirm means, you know, make firm, right? Yeah. So essentially you're making a covenant firm. Um, what covenant do you think this is? The old covenant. The old covenant. Why? <laughs> Because the the new covenant was established by Christ and His blood, right? What do you what what? Why can't they? Why why is the old covenant not established for them right now? Because so they don't have a temple. They don't have a temple. You go all the way back to Deuteronomy, and it tells them that they're not just supposed to carry out their sacrifices in any old place. They carry it out in the place where God names His name, and that's the temple, right? Right. Now we know God names His name in Christ, and those who worship worship in spirit and truth. But they don't have that. Right. So they're looking for the temple. So when he says he will confirm the covenant, what does he really have to do to confirm the covenant to them? If we know that these people destroy the city and the sanctuary, it's very clear the city and the temple. What does he have to do to confirm the covenant? He has to build the temple and sac start sacrificing animals. Right. And we know because he says for one week and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Right. <laughs> right. So, so obviously you have to establish the sacrificial system in order to cause it to cease, right? Right. So this is something, if you read the earliest church fathers on this, like the earliest writers on, on that, they knew that. They, they, they wrote after the temple was destroyed and they said he's going to come back and he's going to endure endear himself to the Jews by rebuilding their temple and allowing them to do the sacrifices again. But in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So we know this is, this is the when the abomination of desolation takes place, right? He right. causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. What is he making desolate? The temple. Right. Because see, we know he destroyed the sanctuary. Now he has to rebuild the temple. He's making it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out in the desolate. Now, do you remember the consummation in the last prophecy we dealt with? Remind me. So if you go back to um, this is the little horn. Mm -hmm. He says, and through his policy and craft, he will cause craft to prosper in his hand. He will magnify himself in his heart and by peace destroy many. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but be broken without hand. Um, Oh, he actually does talk about it here. Look, he says, then I heard one saint speaking. Another said to another saint, how long shall it be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Because uh. um, it does say a host was given to him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. So remember, he said to put an end to the transgression. So the transgression is another way of saying abomination of desolation, transgression yeah. of desolation, right? So it's the thing that he does, and it says he magnifies himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, mm. right? Yeah. So we see all that happen, and remember, see how it says some of the hosts of the stars, uh, he, he cast some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them? Yeah. So we see all this aligning with uh, the dragon being thrown out, right? Yeah. And the abomination of desolation is happening around that time. But here it calls it the transgression of desolation. And the other one, it calls it the abomination that makes desolate. But we know it happens at the same time because it's when the sacrifices are taken away, right? Mm -hmm. So now I think the actual prophecy I was referring to with consummation was in Daniel 7. Um This says... Um, and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and those should be given into his hand until a time times and a dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit and they will take away his dominion to consume and destroy it until the end. So the consummation is the destruction of his dominion. Hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's going to be the outpouring of the wrath of God. But again, we, we're, we're putting these pieces together where we see he's speaking great words against the most high. They're going to change times and laws, right? Then here we have him in, in Daniel 8. We have him uh, taking away the daily sacrifice and casting down the sanctuary. Um, and that's a transgression of desolation that happens. Now we get to Daniel 9. 
and we have um, causing the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and an overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured on the desolate. Why do you think they use the word poured here? Right. Bowls. Right. Bowls are vials of judgment, right? They're poured out on him. So that is the consummation is when those vials are poured on him, right? So right here, we know that the, 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 uh, the overspreading of abominations um, happens in the middle of the week, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there, we have the consummation poured on the desolate. So again, when you have seals and trumpets and bulls, right? Only one of those is poured, right? Uh -huh. You don't pour trumpets, you don't pour seals, right? You pour bulls. Right. So right there, you got from the midway point, the bulls start being poured out, right? So we're, we're getting more and more and more, but now we can put these different layers together and go, okay, so there's this second iteration of the Roman Empire, right? Right. There's this guy who is related to the people that destroyed the temple, right? And the sanctuary in the first time, who now rebuilds the temple and the sanctuary the second time. And then after three and a half years, apparently he defiles it, right? We know he speaks out against the Most High. We know he defiles it. We know there's a number of different pieces that come into place, but we basically know it happens in the middle of this week. It happens in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, right? Uh -huh. And then after that, it looks like this consummation or the, 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 the consuming of his kingdom um, through this pouring out on the desolate is happening, but this desolation continues for that three and a half years, right? He says he makes it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out in the desolate, right? Right. So we have three and a half years in which it's made desolate by this abomination of desolation while this consummation is being poured out on his dominion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to get into the framework. So when we go into Revelation, we've studied this carefully. Do we have room for somebody to tell us that the trumpets happen after the abomination of desolation? Not at all. No. Do we have do we have room for somebody who says um, uh, the wrath is poured out before the abomination of desolation? No, no, right? Because we look we go back to Daniel seven, and this is this is things that you guys are going to have to defend this stuff against people who hold different views, because this is all going to boil down to how much are we going to be here for, and what do we have to prepare our hearts not to be deceived by. And what do we have to wait and watch for? Okay. Right. So when you have people who are getting into this, you got to show him that this judgment sits and they take away his dominion to consume and destroy it. But we know that consummation, see that word consume and the word consummation are the same word starts. Whoops. At the midpoint. In the midst. In the middle of the week. Right. Um, and then they start to consume and just, and it's poured out in the desolate. So we have all that put together and it's just simple. So if, if we have seven seals and then or seven trumpets and then seven bowls, when did the seven bowls start? After the abomination of desolation. After the abomination of desolation. So what, what, uh, what comes first between the trumpets and the bowls? The trumpets. The trumpets. So, if, if the bulls start after the abomination of desolation, where are the trumpets? Before. Before the abomination of desolation, right? Pretty simple, right? Yeah. So we're not even getting into Revelation in, in proof texts and in, you know, Paul and these other things that people are going to argue over yet. We're just going based on what Daniel says. He doesn't say, and then the trumpets will sound. We don't even have any mention of a trumpet, right? We just know there's going to be a, a, a consummation, a consuming of his kingdom that is poured out. On, on the desolate, which is basically those who are made desolate by the abomination of desolation, right? Right. So, so that's what we know is happening. And we know everything is leading us up to this abomination of desolation. Now we're going to have more details and we'll do this next one in one session because it's, it's actually three chapters in a row, but it's going to cover a lot of stuff that is going to be pertinent to us later on before we get into Paul's teaching. Uh, but we already have this midpoint of the 70th week where this revived Roman Empire is and this prince has come, this Antichrist, who allows them to rebuild the temple and then he desecrates it and stops the, the sacrifices. We don't know exactly how he does it yet, but we do know he speaks out against the Most High 
and he causes the sacrifices to cease, right? Right. So we know all that, and then we're going to get into this prophecy, and this is going to now crystallize that picture for us now that we have all that backstory. And then when we get to Paul's teachings on the subject, it's just going to be crystal clear what Paul's talking about, okay? So um, for next week, just go ahead and read 10 through 12. And then uh, that's it. We're just going to cover that. It's, it's all one prophecy, um, but there's a lot of details in there. So make, make sure to take care with what they say. And then I would probably, um, it's, not, it's not necessarily going to be pertinent right away, but I would get to know those, that prophecy at the end of uh, Jeremiah. Um, just because that's going to be a good one to know before we get into the actual book of Revelations, because that's going to come up. Okay. And then if one of you guys can find the one, that would be just kind of a blessing. If one of you guys can find the one in Zechariah, I told you about, about the prophecy ceasing. Mm -hmm. Be a good one to note for future reference. Cool. Sound good? Sounds good. Is that one a little heavier than some of our last ones? Yeah. No. Nah, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm thankful for it because, well, yeah, heavier because I didn't see, like you, when you first asked initially, um, do you see the abomination and desolations in there? Yeah. And then, but it, with, with more, with more uh, reading, yeah, I definitely yeah. see it. And, and the thing is, is they're not always going to use the exact same terminology. That's what you want to make sure you understand. Right. Um, like I said, when you get kind of that already not yet paradigm in your head, you, you start to realize a lot of things can be like a moment and then a period of time. Right. Like, so if, if, uh, Adam dying could be a moment and a thousand years, right? The day of the Lord can be a moment and a thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The desolation can be a moment and three and a half years, right? Yeah. Right. It's the same basic paradigm all over and over, just like a king is a king and a kingdom, right? Right. Um, so, so God can use these words to mean multiple things because he establishes the true meaning of language. And just, just like God is one God and three persons, you know, <laughs> That's his way of doing things because that that uh, that multiple meaning is just built into who he is. So he establishes things like this. So so when we get down to the Trinity later on, we're not freaked out. Like God's always like this, right? Right. <laughs> um, and, and then we can look into the subtleties of language and realize he's not actually masking that from us. We're just reading in how we think it ought to be into what he says. And then he comes back and clarifies it to us. And we're learning to understand him the way he speaks instead of try to impose on how we would speak onto him, right? Right. I think that's what's become more clear in this in this lesson right here is is basically like how you went over the prophecy and showing like, hey, this this could not have been at this time period. So that's right. showing us that it's a dual fulfillment. I think Right. And and that, because because people there there are people who uh, you know will will really have a problem with dual fulfillment and and things like allegories and things like that because they look at it as like you're just stretching the text to make it say what you want to to fit your paradigm right and what i'm trying to show you is like this isn't just something that this is how i make this one prophecy work this is something about how god is consistently giving prophecy in this way it's it's a normal understanding and if you were to talk to jews you know who, who are into their torah and stuff like that and understand the bible they understood the bible this way this isn't something that's foreign to them that things have a dual fulfillment um, even, even in ancient times, you had arguments among the Jews, whether, um, there'd be two messiahs or one messiah with two comings because of all the prophecies. They're like, you can't make this work with just one guy, you know? And, and there was a debate even back then. So this isn't something that is, is foreign if you have the right understanding, but you know, we, you know, the, the very quickly after the church started, most of the Jews were out because outside of the first century, there weren't a lot of Jews accepting. And so that, understanding of how they taught and how you know they had been they had been receiving these words from god and watching them interpreted in their history for thousands of years right mm -hmm. so they understood these things but then when they rejected christ it was almost like the gentiles kind of invalidated everything else that they didn't understand mm -hmm. so you'll find in like the first some of the church fathers you read in like the first and second century um you're going to see some of these paradigms in the way that they think but once you get in the third, um, what's going to overtake those paradigms is things that are going to come more from Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy and their way of allegorizing things. And that's where you're going to get all these distortions that come in and basically eventually build the Roman Catholic Church. So what the, what the Roman Catholic Church is really a combination of Greek uh, Gnostic and philosophical paradigms, 
plus um, kind of a mystical like legalism and trying to return to the old covenant by the Romans. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when you mix those things together, you kind of understand how um, the Roman Catholic Church got so off course, but it didn't just happen overnight. It happened over a thousand years, right? Yeah. So, so anyways, going back to this, um, this uh, slide here, again, these, these 70 years are done. And then of that 70 weeks of years here, and again, I'll give you guys a copy of this so you, you, know, you can take it forward with you. You have these seven weeks to rebuild, and that's Ezra and Nehemiah, and then the 62 weeks that they're waiting for Messiah. Um, and if you, if you understand Ezra and Nehemiah, um, Zechariah and um, Haggai prophes prophecy during um, Ezra, and then during Nehemiah, Malachi prophecies, and that's actually the end of the Old Testament. Like there's no more, there's no more scriptures after Malachi. And so this is around Malachi, and then you have this period of like 400 years of silence where they're waiting with no prophets, no nothing. The Maccabees happens during this period, but there's still no prophets. There's no miracles, no word of the Lord, and then John the Baptist comes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so this finishes off with the death and resurrection of Christ, but there's this 70th week hanging out there that never gets fulfilled, and that's because Rome has these two comings. But again, if you can show people before we ever get to this, it's like, it's not too hard to understand Rome has two comings because all Christians agree that Christ has two comings, right? right? If you just go back to that original statues and say, in the days of these kings, we understand Rome has two comings because Christ has to come and destroy their kingdom spiritually, and then he has to come and destroy their kingdom physically, right? right. Like we have to be born again spiritually before we're born again physically. Because if Christ came you know, in judgment, we'd all be toast came to save us spiritually and destroy the kingdom of Satan spiritually. And then he's going to come to destroy our physical bodies, but give us a new glorified body while he destroys Satan's kingdom physically. So, so we're waiting for the 70th week We're we're approaching it. And uh, once we get through Paul's teachings, then we're going to get into the book of revelation. We're going to start tying all these pieces together to show you what leads up to the 70th week. And then what happens in that first half with the trumpets and then what happens after we're gone in the rapture. Okay. All right. Sound good? Sounds good. Yes. All right. So you guys, yeah, let's knock out Daniel next week, and then we'll be in Paul's teachings, and we'll probably focus on First and Second Thessalonians and then uh, uh, First Corinthians. And we probably can do most of that in one setting. Um, so we'll do that the week after. So we should actually be in the book of Revelation within like three weeks here. Nice. All right. Love it. All right. Uh, Michael, you want to close us out in prayer?